Hi, I'm Ken Dykewald, and today I'm going to have the honor and privilege of interviewing my friend Mark Friedman about his new book, How to Live Forever. Uh, but we're going to go beyond the book and talk about Mark's turning 60. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the breakthroughs in his life and his career, some of the frustrations and fears he still has, the urgency he feels about turning our world into one that's more sympathetic and respectful and empathic about the ways that old and young are, belong together. And uh, I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I know I'm going to enjoy doing it. When I heard you were writing a book about how to live forever, I figured it would be on vegan diets and, and DNA modification and, uh, you know, blood transfusions. So why just surprise us with this other approach? Well, you know, I, I feel like we've, we've spent so much time trying to add to the length of our, our lives and yet too little trying to figure out what's the importance of, of what we do for future generations. And, and so thinking more about the power of legacy uh, than, than the literal uh, desire to, to live on and on rather than, than trying to be future generations to be there for those who actually are going to be um, guardians of, of the future. And so I think I was prompted by a wave of headlines a couple of years ago that focused on, on Google's efforts to radically prolong the lifespan. In fact, coming right through Emeryville over here, I was hit a, a, around the same time with a series of billboards from an insurance company that I, I won't name, but really just, just out the door of this parking lot was a was a billboard that said the first person to live to 150 is already alive. And then as I got on to 80, just a few uh, hundred yards further, there was another one that told us that the percentage of the population living over 100 is going to be uh, dramatically increasing. And so all these questions about the, the focus on longer lives, and yet I felt too little consideration of, of what we actually did during the, the latter phases of life and how that related to people who, who were going to be uh, living into the future. So I, I, I think, you know, maybe one of the inspirations for this book was a, a quote that JFK uh, gave just before the first White House Conference on Aging in the early 1960s where he said we'd added years to life, now it's time to add life to those years. And since that point, I think we've added a, a, something like two months to, uh, two much of the American lifespan every year since, but um, um, not nearly enough time has gone to, to the other part of, uh, of Kennedy's injunction. So I've watched your work and your career now for decades, and um, I must say, as I read your new book, and this is your fourth, um, I was deeply moved by your lifetime commitment to joining the mutual interests of old and young. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're in it now because it's a cool, hip thing. I think this is your life story. Mm -hmm. This is something you've cared about for a long time. Why do you think that's so important to you? You know, I have a rational explanation, which is one that I've told myself over all these years, which is that I was somebody who started out, I was really focused on trying to alleviate poverty. Even 30, 40 years ago, when poverty and inequality were nothing compared to wh what they are today, and it seemed like the place to start was, was with young people. And when I looked at the research about what mattered for kids, it seemed like the presence of a caring adult, uh, being part of a strong social fabric were, always was at the top of the list. In fact, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who created the Head Start program, had a wonderful quote. He said that what every child needs is at least one adult who's irrationally crazy about them. And, and I think it's true. And in fact, I was involved in research on the Big Brother, Big Sister program, which kind of defines that caring adult notion, had been around for 100 years, and had a waiting list of 30,000 kids, 70,000 kids were in the program. Kids on the waiting list were waiting a year and a half. And so we did research. We gave, it took 1,000 kids, 500 got a caring adult, and we just wanted to see what the difference was at the end. There was a 46% difference in kids using drugs, a 50% difference in truancy, a 33% difference in violent behavior. So the, 
this irrationally crazy adult really made a difference, but it also was heartbreaking that so many kids were spending such a long period of time on this list. And when you look deeper, the focus of that program was on finding adults in their 30s and 40s to be mentors for little brothers and, and little sisters. And those adults were struggling themselves to spend time with their own kids, much less have 10 to 12 hours a month for somebody else's kid. So it, it raised this fundamental question about where the human beings were to care, to do the things that only human beings can do. And even then, long before we started to see these demographic changes, but where uh, a prophetic uh, young man was writing a book called Age Wave <laughs> and talking about the need for an elder corps, even back then, uh, it, it was becoming clear that this is where all the untapped human and social capital in society resided in the older population. So I got interested in a way in kind of bringing supply and demand together. I was fascinated to see that of your first 12 credits at Swarthmore, you had incompletes in nine of them. I so think it's an <laughs> intercollegiate record to this day, <laughs> at least division three. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think of you as a guy that gets so much done did you think you'd be a guy that would get so much done back when you were not able to get your courses finished? I'm still trying to finish those courses, <laughs> or at least I wake up, you know, <laughs> once a month in a nightmare, convinced that I haven't finished one of them. But no, you know, it, 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 this relates to your earlier question, too, because I think, you know, I've, I always thought that I was working on these issues from a kind of rational standpoint, thinking about this untapped pool of talent in society, the unmet needs of kids, but it's only recently that I've realized that, that what's really been driving me is I've been such a beneficiary of, of older people who were irrationally crazy about me. You had a mentor in college that that's, was quite an extraordinary person, maybe you'll tell, tell us about him, but took an interest in you even though you were a questionable student at first. It was the silver lining and all those incompletes that you mentioned. You know, at the college that I went to, you had to get permission from the professor if you couldn't finish the class, and and um, you you had to ask for for an incomplete. But the the final step was you had to see this wise in sixty something dean, a guy by the name of Gilmore. Stott, and um, it, it turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me because after nine trips to his office, <laughs> we, were, we were pretty well acquainted, and he took me under wing, and he not only granted me the, the incompletes, but he, he really um, um, gave me a sense that I belonged, and I don't think I would have gotten it with, without him. And he had, you know, a title that was uh, co contrived. He wasn't in you know in a, a position that was particularly vaunted he had a tucked away office at the end of a, of a corridor but i think he played this role for so many people over so many years um, and i've heard from dozens of other people that they would have dropped out of college if it wasn't for this one caring older person and i think for me that provided a glimpse of of the role older people could play in in communities, and I think it's it's almost left me uh, my entire life trying to repay that debt to to Gil Stott to try to uphold this role for older people, to try to create more opportunities for people to play that role as they moved into later life. And now, as I hit later life myself, to think very seriously about whether I'm doing justice to the Gil Stotts of the of the world and how you do that. So. I think those who know you, and so many of us have heard you speak and seen your TED Talks and read your books, I don't necessarily think of you as a guy that would then switch into a graduate school of business. I mean, there you are getting an MBA from Yale. Uh, did you want to be a businessman? Did you want to be a tycoon? Was it your goal to make a lot of money? You know, you know I did an exhaustive study of graduate programs based on how many years they were, and the <laughs> MBA was the shortest I could get away with. So I, I went that route, but I remember uh, at the time that I went to the Yale School of Management, it was in its early days and was very proud of, of proclaiming that it was an experimental program. And I remember being at dinner once and a friend saying, well, if the Yale 
School of Management is an experiment. You must be the control group. <laughs> I didn't, I think after the first uh, semester there, I didn't attend a single class <laughs> the rest of the time and managed to, to wiggle through. But I ended up taking a lot of graduate courses in social science and social history and really thought about being an American cultural historian. I, that, that felt like a, a place where I would be more at home. And I felt like in, in some ways I've been doing a, applied American cultural history ever since. I've been trying to, um, you know, to look at how uh, we got to where we are as a society. Let's go, let's, let's, let's dive into that just for a second, because we're going to yes. wind ourselves <laughs> to a variety of, of, of stories here. But um, many people who work in the field of either, either aging or working with, with young people don't necessarily focus on history. So for example, I know you and I have both been students of David Hackett Fisher and Andy Ackenbaum. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn in your study of the history of young and old that you bring forward with you even into this book? You know, and, and it, I, I think that the questions that I started confronting early on are ones that I'm still wrestling with now, you know, these several four books later. And, it, and it's that, you know, as I looked at my own personal experience, as I looked at the needs of uh, in society, the needs of young people to be nurtured, of older people to be needed, um, how powerful this connection was between generations. It always raised a question, well, if that's true, why isn't it happening everywhere? And I think in a lot of ways I've spent decades trying to understand why this isn't happening naturally, um, convinced that it should happen naturally, and convinced that the reason it isn't is that we thwarted it, and we thwarted it in every corner of American life and went uh, from the beginning of the 20th century being one of the most age integrated societies in the world to where we are today, one of the most age segregated. And so um, I tried to understand, you know, was it a nefarious plot? You know, what were the <laughs> conditions uh, that, that led to this? And so I, I, I think I still have incomplete answers, but I'm, I'm really um, um, curious about how we can learn the lessons from history so, so that we can undo some of the damage that's been done. So as I looked at a lot of this work, what I hadn't known was that early in our history, as you talk about also in your new book, um, we sort of elevated older people. People sought to look old. People would lie about their age, adding a couple of three years. Uh, it was believed that older people had been divinely selected. Mm -hmm. There was no germ theory of disease. So if you were older, God wished you to be a mm -hmm. leader. And I think in a pre-tech era, older people had more just perspective. So they were turned to for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Then it seemed to me that during the 20th century, during the industrial move, new ideas, new cash, new jobs, new technology, new looks, roaring 20s, youth became the hero, um, perhaps culminating in the creation of Youngtown, which you write about in your book, and then Sun City. Uh, many people thought that Youngtown in Arizona and then Sun City were the grand creations, the beginning of a golden age of aging. You're pretty critical. What's your take on what happened with those communities? What, were the, what do you think they were doing? Well, you know, I think that, that my criticism is tempered by understanding more, I think, now why, why they were created and why they caught on. Um, and, and in many ways, they were idealistic places, especially Youngtown, because in the 1950s, at the time that Youngtown was created, the first community entirely for older adults focused on leisure in the middle of the desert, older people were so thoroughly rejected in this country. A few years earlier, Walter Ruther had got up in front of his UAW union and described uh, uh, elders as too old to work, too young to die. I mean, essentially people were being consigned to rocking aimlessly on the, on the porch. And in that context, it, it made sense. Um, also at a time when the teenager was in <laughs> absolute, uh, um, you know, apex of American ob obsession. You know, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers <laughs> had the number one Why hit. And fools fall in love? Exactly. <laughs> so I think this convergence of the rejection of older people and the embrace of, of youth um, as a national identity led for people to come up with ways for older people to uh, 
be younger, seem younger, or at least pretend. And that was the key to a lot of these communities. If everybody was old, nobody was old. You could, you could recapture your youth if you weren't, uh, if it wasn't uh, upended by the presence of actual <laughs> youth. So Youngtown was a small exercise, a few hundred homes. Uh, what do you know about Del Webb? his background before he created Sun City. Yes, well, you know, and just to, to uh, add on Youngtown, what was so striking to me is that it was actually created by an enormously idealistic guy, Big Ben Schleifer, who was a real estate agent in Phoenix and who was essentially trying to recreate a kibbutz for older people in the middle of the desert where they had a sense of community, a sense of, of purpose. It was the first AARP chapter in the country, so it was really a place that, that had very high ideals, and the idea of keeping kids out had a lot to do also with just not making it affordable at a time for working class, uh, older people, um, which, which was the milieu that Schleifer had come from. And then Del Webb um, saw what Schleifer was doing and had this instinct that he was onto something, and Webb was one of the most brilliant leisure entrepreneurs, I think, of the last century, and, and somebody in, who deeply deserves a, a full-length 700-page biography treatment because he's a guy who, who was born in Fresno, who he was the grandson of an English evangelist and the guy who built the first irrigation system in California. And um, uh, his goal in life was to become a professional baseball player. He's about 6'5", um, you know, sturdy guy, uh, except he was a terrible baseball player. <laughs> he was playing here in Oakland in a... <coughs> semi-pro league, and um, finally, in, in his late 20s, he gives up the baseball dream because he gets typhoid fever, gets sent to, to Phoenix to recover, and a year later, he's building the, the Arizona State Capitol. Nobody quite knows how this transformation happened, and in an extraordinary procession of achievements, he invents the motel, he builds Las Vegas. It's it's Del Webb's flamingo that Bugsy Siegel is building in the movie Bugsy. He uh, um, he really reshaped leisure in America, and he probably more than anybody gave us the ideal for retirement that's existed all these years. He coined the phrase the the golden years, and he built Sun St City directly across the street from Youngtown, sunk $2 million into it in the late 1950s. And how many people showed up on opening day? 100,000 people. In fact, there was a great event the preceding night where Webb's lieutenants were sitting around a Mexican restaurant, Manuel's Place in Peoria, Arizona, and nervously wondering if anybody would show up that, that next day. And finally, the guy in charge of sales says, how am I ever going to sell a 30-year mortgage to somebody who's 65 <laughs> years old? And they all, you know, wring their hands. And the next morning, the throngs, there's a traffic jam for 12 miles, the longest traffic jam in the history of the state. And all over the country, people came to find an active new way of life, this golden year's existence. And Webb sold it. It, it um, not only led to a whole age-segregated, leisure-focused uh, housing industry foc focused on the older population, but, but the Golden Years ideal really kind of captured, redefined success in later life. So you don't like that ideal? Well, you know, Are I... You, uh I, 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 can, I can understand why in a, at a time when older people were so rejected and oftentimes isolated, um, disconnected, why the idea of living an active life, being part of a community, um, being um, uh, protected from this social censure that was, was everywhere would, would be so attractive. Um, but there was a uh, an underside to to that vision from the beginning. I mean, we now know that these age segregated retirement communities were the prototype for gated communities more broadly. Um, there, there was from the beginning uh, issues around school bond issues that became more and more pronounced. In fact, one of the most heartbreaking stories came from Sun City in the late '90s when a couple was evicted for harboring their own grandson who was the, a, a victim of abuse, uh, abusive stepfather. It was like the scarlet letter, the community planted a sign on their lawn harboring children. <laughs> the New York Times pointed out that dogs were legal in, in Youngtown, but not children. They fined them $100 a day. And I remember reading a comment at the time that it was unnatural. And I think there was this unnatural dimension 
from from the beginning, and I think that over over time, um, it's become you know more and more worrisome, and and not to mention the environmental consequences of turning you know the desert into a golf course. <laughs> so so there you know. It, while I understand the impetus to create these communities, I think that they've outlived their, their usefulness and it's time to move on from that golden years ideal to one that's gonna better serve us in the 21st century. So, not only are you a social entrepreneur <laughs> and have been acknowledged as such by folks like the World Economic Forum and various organizations in the media, I gotta imagine you think of yourself as a little bit of a philosopher. As I was reading How to Live Forever, you talked about Jung's concern about people wanting to be eternal adolescents. Yes. What's your problem with people wanting to stay young forever? You know, I uh, n now that I'm uh, now that I'm 60, I'm much more sympathetic to that <laughs> to that <laughs> viewpoint. But I think that there's been this all part of of the problem that we were talking about with places like Sun City and Youngtown, which is is. Um, uh, an attempt to hide from the idea of growing older as opposed to embrace it, not just its, its uh, adverse consequences, but also um, the assets that it, that it brings with, with it. And so I feel like we've really needed to have a, a clear-eyed understanding of what, what these, these phases of life um, can truly be and what role those of us in those, these phases can play in society. And I, I'm not suggesting that we go back to the Puritans and, you know, wear white wigs and have special tailors to cut our clothes so that Make we look slumped punch, over. Right? I, I figured I'd be the <laughs> ideal Puritan. <laughs> um, I'm pre-slumped. But, uh, but I, you know, while not idealizing this period, I think we need to, um, to stop running away from it as well. And, and I, I became increasingly convinced um, and I know this is something that you've written eloquently about as well, that, this, that there's a period opening up between midlife and, and old age that is an old age, that in many ways it's, it's uh, very much like the creation of adolescence 100 years ago. It's, um, it's a, uh, some people have said it's a season in search of a purpose. I think our friend uh, Rick Moody may be, be the one who said that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think it's, uh, it's time that we zero in on that, pur on that purpose. Um, when you were a young man, you had a hero who turned out to be a, a partner. Uh, with John Gardner, you created Experience Corps back in the 1990s. And um, there was a quote in your book about the need to be needed. Mm -hmm. Do people as they grow older have a greater need to be needed or is it that society marginalizes them? Or do they marginalize themselves? What do mm. you think? Um, you know, I, I feel like uh, maybe that um, that impulse is uh, accentuated in, in later life as we lose friends and um, and you know, sometimes it seems like the world is passing us by, and I even felt that with, with John. I got to know him when he was in his late 70s, early 80s. He'd been so busy all of his life that I think even, even for somebody who has accomplished as much as he had, there was a sense that of being forgotten, and I felt like that was a great um, uh, gift for me because I, I got to spend more time with him and in an unhurried way than I might have when he was running foundations or being a government official or starting Common Cause. Um, but you know, it was interesting, I, I went back, John I think saw this really early, uh, after he was Lyndon Johnson's HEW secretary, he implemented Medicare during that period, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, he put together a collection of his speeches as, as HEW secretary, and one of them was a, an essay on aging. And a friend of mine found that the book that it, it, the book was called No Easy Victories on a, I think a Green Apple Books in San Francisco in the used book section. And when I look at that essay, it was just stunning to me how prescient it was. He talked about that need uh, of older people to have a you know an important role in life and and connection. But he said something else which I've been thinking about a lot lately, and we ha haven't even had a chance to talk about it in our various com conversations. 
but that he he said th even then that he felt that there was an extraordinarily important role for older people in the caring professions, that those were professions that were never going to be uh, uh, displaced by technology. Um, a machine was never going to be able to, to uh, produce the kind of love that was so essential. And he felt that older people were really built for that kind of, of connection. And I, you know, as I think back now, um, I think there's more and more evidence. You know, we keep hearing that technology is going to render older people obsolete, and in many ways that that is true as a non-digital native. But you know, the more the more that artificial intelligence uh, encroaches on traditional roles that humans played, the more it brings to the forefront how important those qualities of the heart, of love, that are so essential to so many different roles in society are, and I believe those are the things that peak as we get older. In How to Live Forever, you not only create a vision of what's possible, but you, you, tell, you have so many remarkable examples. Uh, tell me just a little bit about Aggie and Louise. Well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about them, and I mean, that was, you know, I had close relationships with a number of older people, Gil Stott, in, in college, um, John Gardner, you, you know, you mentioned both of them, but n none had as much an impact on me as as relationship with Aggie and Louise. In fact, I. And who are they? That, so they're they're two very short women, <laughs> <laughs> long since passed. Uh, uh, Louise was four ten, and Aggie was uh, the tall one, as they would describe themselves. She was four foot eleven. They were. Uh, foster grandparents in, in Portland, Maine. Uh, Aggie had been a waitress. Uh, Louise had worked in a sawmill and become a minister, a Were lay they minister. They weren't. They met each other through this program. They had both failed retirement and um, and decided that they came from you know very modest means, very little education, um, and they ended up spending the final two decades of their lives in this war on poverty creation called the Foster Grandparent Program, which, which connects low-income older people one-on-one -on -one with children in need, either developmental disabilities, health issues, or, or uh, young people growing up in poverty. And they got sent to the pediatrics ward of Maine Medical Center in, in Portland, which it's was an excellent medical center. Excellent medical center, uh, the biggest and best hospital in that state, um, and at the destination for families whose kids all over the region. Were they, did they have nurse training or medical training? No, you know, they, I mean, they did um, become pretty sophisticated at the workings of the ward because they were there for so many years mm -hmm. and they were really seen as an essential fabric. They, they were there for 20 hours a week. They got paid a, a modest stipend mm -hmm. during that period. Um, but mostly they were kind of the heart and soul of the pediatrics ward in the way maybe that Gilstadt was <laughs> back in my, College days, and you know, as you know from some of the talks and and from the book, I mean, one of the most dramatic um, uh, aspects of their work is 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 that they oftentimes were very much involved when kids were in their in their final hours. And and if I remember right from your story, that in Maine, because so much of the state is rural, that there would be some moms or dads whose kids would be in the pediatric ward, but the parents couldn't be there very often. Right, you know, Maine's a huge state. I mean, four or five hours up to the Canadian border from, from Portland. And so imagine, you know, you're eight years old. Um, your parents are working in a sawmill or as a waitress. They've got three other kids. They live hours away. And after spending two weeks at the hospital with you, um, they have to, to leave. And so you're eight years old. You're, you've got cancer or some other, you know, really terrible illness and you're in an institutional setting hours away from home and and your parents are gone and that's really where Aggie and Louise came in and they became surrogate family to these children and you know when I was writing this book I forgot about one of the stories that Aggie had told me um, which was a, about a, 
a young girl who was a, a teenager who had a heart condition that you know became clear she wasn't going to survive, and she had a hard time talking to her parents about it because it was so devastating for the parents. And so she talked. Aggie was her outlet in those final months. And, and then Aggie told me the story about how when she did pass away, the parents called her. It was the middle of the night, um, and, and the girl had wanted Aggie to be one of the first to know. And when the obituary came out in the, in the newspaper, it described this girl as being survived by her parents and her sister and by her foster grandparent, uh, Aggie Bennett. And I, I think that just showed the depths of connection. I mean, these women really became family to these kids. And I, you know, I would ask them gingerly, you know, how they kept from being devastated and depressed by all this. But I, I felt like it, it, it goes back to your what question. Did they say? But I remember Aggie telling me it's not a job, it's a joy. And there was this incredible joy of playing such a, an essential role. And it goes back to your question earlier about the need to be needed. I mean, they felt so needed. Um, that Marge Piercy, the poet, says that the pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. And I think that kind of captures this, this great sense of life and joy and connection that they felt. I mean, I think they really felt like they did their most important work after they <laughs> were uh, finished their, their midlife careers. They made a, a monument out of what it could have been in the leftover years. It, it's hard for me to not stop and kind of think about the respect I have for you because you have looked at this phenomenon of the age wave and the changing demography and the longevity economy and, and instead of thinking, oh, bottle caps for the elderly or non-skid rugs or ski resorts for silver-haired people, you're looking at the needs, the unmet needs of youth and this incredible resource of elderhood and wanting them to marry more. Mm -hmm. What is it about you that causes you to see that in the room full of possible things to pay attention to? Yeah, you know, I think, I think um, you know, that's been one of my realizations over the years, too, is, you know, I very much started out in an almost clinical, you know, supply and demand. You know, we got all these kids who need attention. We got all these older people who are watching TV, you know, and I always think about, the research and writing you've talked about, about the hours of TV older people. And 49 hours a week, the average. Yeah, week. and that was even before Netflix, right? Yeah, so right. it's, uh, um, so, so, but I think over the years, and, and certainly those experiences with Aggie and Louise cemented it, is that, that even more important was something fundamental about the human experience that we had lost and that was being recaptured in places like the pediatrics ward of Maine Medical Center. And so oftentimes, you know, if I'm trying to talk to a policymaker or a funder, I'll use the supply and demand language. But I think it's really ultimately about uh, more than efficient efficiency, it's about humanity. And I think that, you know, I feel like we could fix the efficiency problem. We could connect supply and demand, but even more important, it, by doing that, it will fix us. It will connect us to something that's essential about being a human being. So there's a lot of buzz about creating fountains of youth, fountains yeah. of youth <laughs> in a bottle. Where do you come out on the fountain of youth? Um, well, the older I get, the more I find myself cheering <laughs> these longevity <laughs> advances on, especially since I decided to have kids in my 50s and I need to get them through college at least while I'm still standing. But I, um, you know, again, I feel like the, you know, years to life uh, and life to years, it's so much easier for us to get our arms around demographic numbers, to get our arms around life expectancy. Um, and so much harder to come to terms with what's unique and distinctive about later life, what role can we play in society. And I mean, that's been the big change for me. To turning 60, I get to use the first person. What, what role can we play? And what I'm responsibility? Turn to your aging in just a moment. Yes. Before. But I, you know, so I, I feel like it, it's um, exasperating to see how much money we're investing in, in lengthening lives and how little in, in what the, that those extra years are all about.
So how would you characterize this fountain of youth? Uh, well, I, you know, I have this mnemonic phrase that rattles around my head that the real fountain of youth is, is the fountain with youth. That the, the real way to live on um, is through investing in, in younger generations rather than trying to be those younger generations in, in perpetuity. And I think that's something fundamental about the human project. You know, I was reading Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, uh, who was the former chief rabbi of, of the UK, and he, he writes about Moses and how Moses lived to 120, that great biblical um, uh, uh, age, and yet the whole latter part of his life was focused on not trying to get to the promised land himself, but, but to help be Moses the teacher, to help the next generation that would inhabit that future, um, uh, prepare for it. And I, I think there's some real lessons to us and there are many other uh, examples throughout human history of that idea of, of older people as trustees of the future, um, uh, helping um, to leave a legacy, to live a, le a legacy. And I think that's something that we've lost in our obsession over living longer and longer and staying younger and younger. So. As we live longer, and in a moment I'm going to ask you some very personal questions, but I, I look at your meta messages, experience, encore, prime, purpose, generation to generation. You feel proud of that? I do, but it's it's evolving, and I I feel like the question of, uh, for example, purpose. Uh, brings, uh, you know, how to find purpose brings with the question, you know, what kind of purpose? What's the highest purpose in, in this period of life? And I think I've, I've come down on the side of, of this idea of generativity. We were talking earlier about y you knowing Eric Erickson and Joan Erickson, and they were so eloquent about that. And I remember a great interview they did with Daniel Goleman some 30 years ago in the latter part of their life in which they felt as a society that generativity was something that we were losing. And, and Erickson had described that as in being encapsulated in the phrase, I am what survives of me. Um, what is it that we've given to, to future generations that lives on? And, and George Valen at Harvard Medical School, who's also you know, written eloquently about this, has, has a beautiful phrase, biology flows downhill. And it essentially, essentially argues that the real fountain of youth is the fountain of youth, or the fountain of happiness, at least, is investing in youth. He finds that, that older people who mentor and connect with younger generations in meaningful ways are three times as likely to be happy as those who failed to do so. So I think that the secret to happiness in later life has always been right in front of us, and it's not extending later life necessarily, but it's, it's through investing in, in younger generations. And uh, you know, it does raise, I mean, if biology flows downhill, why not society? Why is it so hard to play that role? Okay, and Thank you, and also you didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> my question had to do with, wow, you have really landed on major pivots of humanity. And uh, do you feel proud of that? The ones you've picked, the ones you have dedicated yourself to, the impact they've had. I, I you do. allow yourself to feel proud? I, I, I do feel proud of it. Nobody's looking, wow, well, I'm doing a great job. <laughs> you know, there, there have been some moments where I, I felt that, that way. Um, you and I both go on to some Purpose Prize events, and um, hearing the stories of the Purpose Prize winners, I, I felt um, just very grateful to play a role in elevating these stories, which go against the prevailing narrative of, of decline and de selfishness. So I do feel proud of that, but I, I do feel frustrated 20 years into this work at how little progress we've actually made and how often I feel like we're still heading down the wrong path when it, when it comes to, to later life. And so in some ways it, it's, um, um, uh, I'm almost wistful because, you know, as a, as a would-be historian, I spent a lot of time rummaging through congressional testimony from the early 1960s um, and being absolutely stunned at how expansive the vision um, um, being discussed in 
the, the carters of power in that period were about older people. You know, you've called for an, an elder core, and people were talking about that idea back then as well. Um, you had, you know, JFK. 30 years ago. Yeah. Yes. And JFK was in the 60s. I had no role in that. Yeah. <laughs> but he, oh, you know, Kennedy had argued that we needed a Peace Corps for older, older people, people and that, um, and Bobby Kennedy talked about how older people don't want to go to the seashore. You know, they want to have a life of, of significance. Okay, but. So why I'm haven't I'm we? still back to my question. <laughs> Notwithstanding, you're a really good answerer. My question, do you feel any, how much do you ever let yourself feel proud of what you've done with your life? Uh, the, the, the way you've used your life on behalf of this mission? I, you know, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it goes back to all those incompletes. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I have Still a, work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. And, and in a way, um, I worry even that the things that have, have um, that I've worked on that have represented progress um, um, are in jeopardy of, of being lost. And I, so I, I feel that if, if anything, um, you know, we're only slightly beyond where we were 20 years ago when I, when I started Encore. And that, uh, you know, in the context of the new demographics, I feel this great sense both of disconnection and, and urgency. Because in truth, you know, we're not doing right by future generations. We're not playing the roles that you and I have both argued for for, for all these years. Um, I do think that there is a movement um, of, of people who, who are doing that and whose voices aren't heard and whose work isn't recognized. But we, we do have a lot of work to do and, it, and it's urgent. Last question before I ask you some personal questions. So let's just imagine magic for a second. If somehow there I had a genie's bottle here and you could rub it and make a wish regarding all of this work of yours, mm -hmm. what would be different? Hmm. Well, you know, I went, I went uh, rummaging around the planet last year to try to get examples of that, uh, you know, maybe because I, I wanted to, to see in three dimensions what was happening. You know, there's that great quote, the future's already here, it's just, just unevenly, unevenly distributed. distributed. Right. Abs I, so I wanted to see where it was being distributed in a positive way, and it, it did leave me feeling really uh, um, encouraged. And even going back to, you know, some of these efforts that happened in the 1960s here, I think show what's possible. But I, 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 I'll give you two examples. I went to Singapore where they've got a grand plan. They're going to spend $3 billion in Singaporean dollars, so a mere $2.1 in, in American dollars, you know, over the coming years to create a society that's the envy of the aging world um, that shows in particular what role older people can play in the lives of younger generations and that draws on long cultural traditions in Singapore. In fact, one of the phrases that I kept encountering there is a kampong for all ages, and kampong being the Malay word for village. And, and I, I, you know, I went to see whether this was glorious rhetoric and big bucks or whether there was something behind it. And I, I, you know, I left feeling like the, the rhetoric and the bucks were almost secondary. There was so much happening in a way where, where all segments of the community were rallying around this idea of a multi-generational future. I went to two churches, I, um, one or re religious organizations, one was a, a massive uh, nursing home, St. Joseph's, which had created the first intergenerational playground in its yard, had a preschool for hundreds of children um, that was um, um, uh, right in the middle of an of, uh, 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 elementary school across the street, uh, a home for wayward boys next mm. to it, and Google Singapore <laughs> on the other side. Really? And it was, a, it was, you know, it was a you know, very powerful experience. And then in the end, I went to uh, an, another church, St. Margaret, St. John's, um, near the National University of Singapore, where they also were building um, uh, a massive preschool and, and a whole array of programs through something they were calling Project Spring Winter. And I, I just was struck by how everybody seemed to be pitching in and, and enthusiastic about it. And so that was kind of the 
grand plan. And then I went to London and saw uh, uh, a project, Now Teach, which is essentially like Teach for America for the UK, although unlike Teach for America, this was a call to action by a, uh, a revered financial columnist in the UK, Lucy Kellaway, people over 50 to quit their jobs and teach science and math to low income children. Uh, first year they had 20 slots, a thousand people signed up. They eventually expanded to 47 slots just a hand. And it was an example of, of uh, a charismatic leader calling her peers to, to action. And you know, we just don't hear that enough here. You know, what, when do we hear the president or presidential candidates or, or you know, other leaders of society calling older people to play essential roles. And so, you know, these two examples of the kind of grand plan with lots of money and the, the Pied Piper who is um, prepared to, to act on this vision and calling others to, to do the same. You know, I'd like to see elements of that happening in the United States, and I think it can. Uh, and it's really basically up to us now that we get to use the first person at this juncture in our lives to, uh, to make that happen. So I want to ask you some personal questions. Uh, okay. I apologize if I get too personal. Uh, I'll just give you the unexpurgated answers. <laughs> continuation of discussions you and I have been having over lunch uh, for the last number of years. So you turned 60 this year. Um, do you think of your own aging as an ascent or a descent? Mm -hmm. um, well, there there are aspects that are are decent, um, like. and I, I do worry about my physical health. Um, I worry about whether I'm going to be I have, especially having young kids, whether I'm going to be able to continue to be an active part of their lives for as long as that I want to. I sometimes will do the math, you know, when our eight-year-old is X age, how old will I be? And then I relate that. So I, I, I think that there is more fear. There's, there's also, um, I think, a kind of um, um, palpable um, sense of being aware of the passage of time and how quickly time does go by and that it does really go by. <laughs> and so I do feel this kind of unique um, moment of, of valuing the time that I have more than ever before and not taking it for granted in ways that, you know, I probably was doing even into, into my 50s. In what way uh, has aging been an ascent for you? What has uh, gotten better? You know, I think it relates to that sense of being more conscious of the passage of time, that recognizing that you, you can't do everything. So what what matters most and zeroing in on on those things and for me it's a place where the personal and professional have really converged i've got these little kids like i had my own grandchildren <laughs> so that is clearly you, you know very much it, in the forefront of my mind and and also this intergenerational opportunity in the work which i i really feel um more acutely than ever. You know, started out working on Experience Corps, which was essentially an intergenerational mentoring program. And now, 30 years later, um, I'm again very much focused on these intergenerational issues. Although then I was in my 20s or early 30s. And now I, you know, I'm uh, more than eligible to be an Experience Corps member. Um, and so I, I do think that. Um, um, you know, on, more than ever, I'm, I'm trying to focus on, on those things that I feel are, are most essential um, and trying to make decisions based on that. Do you feel smarter than you were when you were younger? Uh, I, don't, I don't feel uh, as sharp as I was, but I, um, I do feel, um, you know, even, even in this book, I, I felt prouder of, um, of the way things turned out than anything I'd done beforehand. And I think it was because I was um, more willing to be open, honest, uh, emotional, uh, real um, than, than ever before. So, you know, so there have definitely been, you know, there are ways which I, uh, I wish I, I 
could do as many things as I did previously, but I do feel in a way that I'm, I'm better, if not necessarily smarter. <laughs> You mentioned Erickson, and you relate to his work with generativity, but also he talked about wisdom as mm -hmm. being uh, something to be cultivated in one's later years. How do you think you're doing on the wisdom thing? Um, I, I think that I'm, um, I may be doing better on the wisdom than the wisdom in action, because, you know, one of the things that I've been really facing, and I haven't, I haven't said this before, maybe even in, in our other conversations, but having had all these years of being in the presence of older people who were extraordinary at the wisdom in action, who were great mentors, um, I don't feel like I'm yet that good at it. I hope, I hope that I will be, but I felt like I've been much better at receiving than giving. <laughs> and I'm trying to shift that balance and really kind of more consciously understand, you know, what is it that they did that really, uh, that I really valued when I was on the receiving and, and wondering how I could do a more, a better, more conscious, more active uh, job of that in, in my own interactions with younger people. What about, um, let's put the word fear out here for a minute. What frightens you at this stage in your life? You know, I, I think I'm much more comfortable with things going off in their own direction if it's because, uh, you know, a vibrant movement is, has taken hold and it, it is moving by the logic of, of movements, which is going where the action is. Mm -hmm. What worries me is that we won't get to that point, that it's still going to be a handful of, of people who are trying to drive this forward with very little financial support and very little political support and policy support. I mean, that, that feels um, like pushing a rock up, uphill. Um, I, and so, um, I, I guess, um, uh, you know, I, f I, I feel like we're at a, a kind of uh, a poignant moment right now about whether the, this movement will take hold. You know, will this become like Lean In or Me Too or other movements that have, um, y you know, really changed the culture, changed society, um, or will it just continue to struggle? Do you want to live to 100? Um, I, um, I, I think I, I think I would like to, uh, to be healthy and t w well into my 80s. I think that's my goal right now. Um, if I had a pill here that I could give you and allow you to live another 50 to 100 years, what would you think of that? Uh, I'd have ambivalence. Um, you know, we barely as a planet can sustain the, the population growth we have now. You know, what, what will that mean for the resources that we've got if I can, if I can take a pill like that and, and many others were, you know, I'd really rather, rather focus on living a natural lifespan and doing everything I can to, to benefit future generations. So I'm a little bit, I think I'd be more inspired by doing work that, that lives on beyond my years than by trying to buy extra time. And you know, and that's coming from somebody who spent his entire uh, student career trying to buy extra time. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I, I'm not so interested in getting another extension right now so much as doubling down and trying to do the work that will um, resonate long, long beyond our, our years on the planet. All right, so I'm gonna introduce a, another piece of the puzzle often doesn't get asked especially if our topic is how to live forever. Um, you and I were in a discussion here in these offices a few years ago, and we were talking about why people, as they grow older, may give more. And you said, death, that was your one-word answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't you explain that? Yeah, you know, what's, I the you what's the role of death in a life? You know, I think of it as mortality in some ways. You know, we've begotten so much more comfortable talking about the end of life and preparing for the end of life. We still have a long way to go, but, but we're, we're improving uh, at being mortal. Where I think we have a lot of, of work to do is around living mortal, which is, is accepting the end of life, our, our own mortality, 
you know, before we're at death's door, and when we still have time to, t we have all of our faculties and time and energy um, to live in ways that we can be proud of when we do get to the end. David Brooks has talked about the eulogy virtues um, in contrast to the resume virtues. We spend so much of our life trying to add on to the resume virtues and not enough thinking about what we want, what we want to have said <laughs> about us at that memorial service. Well, I think there's this unique moment in later life, and I, I do feel to some extent that I'm, I'm very much at that moment now where we know what matters most and we have time to actually do the work <laughs> to, to realize those, those goals. And I think that's one of the, is why the, our longer lives and, and improved Improved health is, you know, really constitutes a, a sweet spot. Uh, we, you talked earlier about about Carl Jung, and um, and I think a lot about G. Stanley Hall as well. And he he described this period of life as an Indian summer. And he said human beings didn't reach the height of their powers until the shadows started slanting eastward. And I think that for me the Shadows are maybe starting to slant eastward, and so you you know you know you don't have forever, but you do have a really remarkable opportunity to to focus on those things that might endure. Let's stay on this superpowers idea for a second. <laughs> it, it's hard for us not to realize we're sort of in a Marvel era uh, in the theaters and video games. Most of these Marvel comic heroes are young, strapping ageless beings. Can you imagine an elder superhero? And if so, what capabilities would they have more of? Mm. Um, you know, I have been struck in, in a number of these action movies how the theme of, of young people seeking out older people who have, have gone into seclusion, who felt like they don't have the the powers that are needed by the younger generation. And, and it's the younger generation. so. In the last installment of the of the Star Wars franchise, the young warrior Rey goes to find Luke Skywalker in this remote area and insists that he help guide her and and work with her. Um, more down to earth, I'm from Philadelphia, so I, I watch all the Rocky movies. In <laughs> in Creed, uh, Apollo Creed's son comes to find Rocky in Philadelphia and insists that he train him. And I, I do feel like those scenes, you know, not only make good cinema, but they do capture, I think, part of the zeitgeist that's not fully appreciated, which is it's not um, just that older people have this need to invest in the future and get that kind of, of joy and, and fulfillment, but, but younger people need us to do it. Um, and I felt like as a younger person, I know you felt this way, we, we sought out older people. You sought out Maggie Kuhn, I sought out John Gardner and Aggie and Louise. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like that, that same thing is true today because it's, it's something that's fundamental about the human experience. Um, and I think that, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's too hard to, uh, to find us. Uh, uh, these modern elders, as our friend Chip Conley d describes, so how do we create a society which, in which this happens more naturally, where it doesn't require a, a heroic super <laughs> hero effort to find elders or to be an elder in the way that we're, we're talking about. And we've done everything possible to make it difficult. You know, we've created this age segregated society where schools and workplaces and senior living facilities are all separate from each other. The twains don't meet. Uh, you need a, an actual mentoring program. You need an experience core to connect people. How do we get back to a society where this happens uh, block by block in the workplace, in, in schools, where um, something that should be natural, it in fact, is. Imagine that you could travel back to the young Mark Friedman. Mm. Now that you're in your seventh decade of life and you mm -hmm. had love and children and organizations and legendary being in some circles. What advice would you whisper in the ear of a 20, 25-year-old you? You know, I feel like the, the 
path that I've had has not been a, a linear or rational one. I, mount, I managed a modern dance company. Um, I went to business school. Um, uh, I ended up focusing on young people growing up in poverty um, and yet ended up spending a lot of my working life focused on the role of older people in society. And it, you know, it didn't it didn't follow uh, a plan, and it was almost like being in a pinball machine. <laughs> but there was a there was a logic to it, um, and I think if I if I were to go back and and whisper in my ear it, it's to tell myself that that's okay, that that you um, to to roll with the punches, <laughs> and I think that you know so many of the young people I talk to today they want to have control, they they want to you know follow this ordained path uh, in a way that makes rational, linear sense of the world and of life. And I, that's never been my experience. I just wish I was, uh, hadn't had so much anxiety about it. All right, so now I'm going to flip it. If somehow I could conjure up the young Mark Friedman, who would be looking at who Mark Friedman has become, what would the young Mark Friedman's advice be? Eat fewer donuts. <laughs> I recently realized I had a whole collection of donut t-shirts without ever <coughs> aspiring to have a collection of donut t-shirts. So you know, maybe some of it is to you know to live right uh, so that you can live a little bit longer. Um, but I I think um, I am really um, feeling like I've been more selfish in the mentoring realm than, than perhaps I should be. I think even now in my 60s, I'm, I'm looking for more people to take me under wing. <laughs> I, think, I think I need to be, uh, to be doing more to, uh, to nurture the next generation. You're hard on yourself, aren't you? I, I am, but I'm sure it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so if there would be a song that comes to your mind that in a way is the song that would be the soundtrack of your life. What song would that be? I, I can answer that question, although I'm not sure it um, um, will be that meaningful to that many people, but I, I love music and I started out as a, I had a public radio show in my youth uh, uh, in Philadelphia. And I, in fact, I, in the book I tell a story of driving to see my father who's in a, a nursing home in Philadelphia and listening to that station that decades earlier had had a show in the, and John Prine's song Hello in there yeah, yeah. about loneliness in later life mm -hmm. came on the radio. But, but one of my favorite songs is by a guy named Guy Clark who was a, a, one of the um, godfathers of what is now the kind of music that comes out of Austin, Texas. A kind of alter he wrote a song called Desperado's Waiting for a Train about his relationship with uh, an old man who was his surrogate grandfather growing up in, in Texas. Um, and uh, that song, I think, in, in many ways is going to form the soundtrack of, uh, of and it, it's about uh, a boy who um, who is um, is drawn to this older man and who um, uh, becomes very close to him. He feels like the older guy has never been, really been given his due in life. Um, um, to me, he's one of the heroes of this country. Is one of the lines. So why is he all dressed up like like those old men? He's in a bar playing cards, and then who um, who gets to be uh, gets the point of. Uh, the boy gets to the point of being older himself, and just this reminder that you know it's a journey that we all go through. So anyway, that's a, that's one of my favorite uh, well, songs. Thank you. All right, so I know not everybody knows this. I know that um, you're a fanatical basketball fan, and we're both Dubs fans. Um, so who on the Warriors team is your favorite player? And if somehow you could be one of the players. Which game is your game? Well, you know, I, I have to confess that I, I showed you uh, my Steph Curry keychain. I, I do. I, I have it on me cheesy. at, at, yeah, at all times. It's uh, my Steph Curry likeness <laughs> right over here. Maybe he should be on the, on the book. And, it, you know, I guess my answer is slightly qualified. It's, it's David West, who is no longer officially on the Warriors, but was such a 
key part of their championship team over the last couple of years, and he was the elder of that team. He, he was widely regarded as, you know, the African-American historian of the NBA, a guy who spent a lot of time um, mindful of history and kind of gave the younger players a, a broader perspective. Also, the fact that he, uh, you know, was 6'9 with a chiseled physique is somewhat appealing as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just, uh, I'll just take uh, the, uh, the wise elder part of uh, David West. Excellent. A couple of more questions? Sure. So, you are sort of an interesting piece of work because you're a philosopher, you're a writer, you're a speaker, you're a traveler, you're a humanitarian, you're a crusader. I'm a very good bowler also. So are, you, are you actually a good bowler? <laughs> I was in my youth. <laughs> what is the highest score you ever bowled? I, I think it was uh, about 250. Wow. Um, and I had a I had a monogrammed bowling ball. You did? Yeah, I can't find it well, uh, that, anymore. That would, be, but that would be worth at least five dollars <laughs> today on eBay. <laughs> so, all right. What are, what are Leslie Gray, your wife, what are Gabriel, Levi, and Micah think of you? I mean, do they think you're a crazy man or do they have, do they get what you're doing with your life, do you think? What are your family, what does your family make of you? You know, I, uh, I, I think about the kids initially and I think that they, they don't understand what I'm doing now in any kind of conceptual way other than the fact that it keeps me from being home as, as much as I, I should be. But I think in one day that they, they will understand it. And the reason is that we have these two extraordinary neighbors who are in their 80s, Joyce and Jake Anderson, who have become surrogate grandparents for our kids. My family's on the East Coast, Le Leslie's family's in Southern California. And so they're, our kids are actually experiencing on a near daily basis a lot of what I'm pontificating about. And so I think one day when they get a little older that they may put their own experience and the kinds of things that I've been, uh, been writing about together and say, oh, that, you know, that, that makes some sense. So long after, imagine it's long after you and I are gone, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, whatever it is. Um, when people talk about Mark Friedman, what would you most wish they'd say? Um, Mark maybe, Friedman, he... Uh, you know, he was, um, he was working on something that was inevitable. <laughs> you know, that there, in a way, when something as big as what you and I have dreamed of for all of these years actually happens, um, it seems like, like it was inevitable, like that's the way it's always been. Um, and and uh, I think there, there's a, a sense of um, um, that, um, it, it, you know, that, that this must have been happening all along the way. And so I hope, um, I hope when uh, history uh, sweeps us away, they'll, they'll, it'll seem like we were just doing something that was going to happen anyway. But we would, we'll know, you know, as we twist and turn in our, our graves that, that we were actually upholding an ideal that, um, that was far from inevitable, that um, um, is, is required a lifetime of work to, to help realize. Still at this point in the future, and separate from how people might reflect on the work, the honorable work you do and will continue to do, what are the couple of three adjectives you hope that people apply to you? He was, what kind of person do you want them to be thought of as? Um, I, I, uh, kind, uh, humane, um, and, um, you know, I wonder, I wonder about the third, but um, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's not visionary. It, it's almost the opposite. Instead of looking far off into the distance, it kind of looking inward at something that was, essentially, he, you know, that he saw um, something that was fundamentally human that we were, we were struggling to, uh, um, that was hidden in plain sight. And so I really feel like I, in a way, I've been just, um, uh, obsessed with something so simple and so fundamental, um, and often s and, and so often overlooked, which is is that older and younger people are are built for each other. That we're 
put on the earth <laughs> to connect and support each other that if you go back to the beginning of you know human evolution um, was evident but that we've lost uh, a feel for in the modern world and that that um, you know that I feel like I've been trying to help recapture um, and to do so in a way that's not nostalgic you know essentially to find new ways to do old things two more questions one is of your four books this is my favorite uh, I felt it was soulful. Uh, it gave me examples of what I could be, it explained things that I hadn't thought through as deeply as you have, it showed me who you were, stories about your dad and your family and your struggles. Um, what are you hoping this book does in the world? There's, there's a world without How to Live Forever, mm -hmm. and then there's the world with How to Live Forever. What are you hoping happens from this book? You know, I, I hope it gets a life of its own um, and, um, and begins to ignite um, an appreciation of something fundamental about the human experience. Um, and I, you know, I feel the same way about it. I, I almost feel disconnected from, from how um, the world receives it because I feel like I got to finally say something after all of these attempts um, that is, um, uh, y y you know, is really that that I that I've learned from life, and a lot of it. Y you mentioned my father is in in the book. I I felt like this book um, almost um, came from a a, a non-conscious place. <laughs> it kind of wrote itself, and and I thought it was um, telling that it's going to be released on November thirteenth, um, which also is the when we're going to be celebrating our 20th anniversary as an organization, and that happens to be my father's birthday. So maybe there's some karma re related to it. But I felt like this is the book that, um, more than any of the others, um, was it conveys what I've, what I've learned from this journey over all these uh, many decades. Um, your dad was a gym teacher in Philadelphia. And, uh, you and your sister's love and respect for him shines, uh, touches us in this book. There was a reading at his funeral, We Wait Too Long. Do you mm -hmm. remember any of the parts of that? You know, my father was somebody who, um, who didn't wait too long. He didn't have a grand theory of what he was trying to do like maybe I, I've tried to have all over these years. He um, it, it was just driven uh, instinctively to invest in, in younger generations. He wanted to be a teacher. He was a marvelous teacher, but, but had to move into the principal's office and administrative suite in order to support his family. And when he was pushed into retirement at age 60, um, instead of going off to Youngtown and Sun City and polishing his golf game, he started organizing track meets for elementary school students. He became a substitute teacher. And I would always ask, you know, how can you do that in an urban high schools in, in Philadelphia, in public schools? And, and he could have easily conveyed Aggie and Louise's advice to me that it wasn't a job, it was a joy. He did it into, into his 80s and finally, in a way, was liberated in later life to do those things that he had set out to do in his 20s, which was to work directly with young people. But I did think it was ironic at the time we were creating Experience Corps in Philadelphia to uh, engage older people in the lives of kids. He was essentially being given a golden parachute for being too old from, this, from the school district. So I think he's somebody who, who didn't wait too long, who really made full use uh, throughout his life um, of his uh, caring and compassion. Um, but he didn't really uh, get very much recognized for it. Your decision to select the, the, the sentences from We Wait Too Long, since I know you're extremely well read, why that message? Um, you know, I think that um, uh, in some ways, you know, we think of, of retirement or later life as this time when we're going to do all these things that <laughs> we were planning to do. And, um, 
And I, I, you know, I don't think we should load up all of these aspirations, whether they're for leisure or for doing good, into this future period that we should be be focused on it all along the way, and um, and that we should have a sense of urgency because, again, you know, I'm feeling more conscious than ever the passage of time. We we all should, even in the context of growing longevity. So uh, no more extensions, uh, no more deferring in, into the future. The world needs us. It needs its elders. Um, and we have to come forward and, and, uh, and give what we can to, to the future that we won't ever see, but that we're deeply connected to nonetheless. Can I ask you to go biblical for one second? I, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, your kids' names all seem biblical. Gabriel, Levi, and Micah. I think one of them is a lesser prophet, though. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell don't, don't, don't say who it is. Um, something about an older man, the story in your book, and why are you planting seeds or something. What's that story? You know, I've been um, um, really captivated by this Greek proverb, uh, society grows great when older people plant trees under whose shade they shall never sit. And I would close speeches with that sentiment. And it was striking at my father's memorial service right after the we wait too long prayer that the rabbi talked about a story from the Talmud of uh, an older man who's down on the ground planting uh, an uh, acorn and uh, a kind of dyspeptic rabbi comes upon him and says skeptically, you know, old man, why, why are you planting this acorn when you're, uh, you know, lucky to make it another year or so? And the, the man turns up and looks at him and says, you know, I spent my whole life under the shade of trees that people planted before me and that's why. I'm planning the tree, these, this tree for those who will follow. And I thought that it was a reminder that it's not just a Greek proverb or a Talmudic tale, but it's something universal about the human experience that, that we live on through investing in future generations. And that the only true way to live forever is to live together, not just in the present, but across time. So Mark, you and I have written a lot of books, some of them have done well, some not as well. So I've been thinking about in this new era of social media and connectivity, what can we do, what can you do to really make your book be a big bestseller? And my team put together this board, <laughs> which we think you ought to wear and go walking around Telegraph <laughs> Avenue in Berkeley. And I just think you can start a revolution if you were like a placard yeah. just like this. What do you think? I, I love it. Plus, if you order now, you get the steak knives and the clapper. <laughs> <laughs>